And next up, we're joined by Laura Vandenberg. Laura is the author of two previous collections, The Isle of Youth and What the World Will Look Like When, when the, All the Water Leaves Us, and the novels Find Me and The Third Hotel. The Third Hotel was finalist for the Young Lions Fiction Award, which I want to say I was on, I, I'm a reader on the committee for that award, and I thought it was a oh, very cool. deserving finalist, and I was happy that that happened. Oh, cool. Uh, and in the next pick, a pal's book's indispensable pick and named a best book of 2018 by over a dozen publications. Laura's stories have been anthologized in the Best American Stories, the Best American Mystery Stories, the O. Henry Prize Stories, the Best American Non-Required Reading. Her most recent collection, I Hold a Wolf by the Ears, was published by Farrar, Strauss and Giroux in July and named a best summer read by the New York Times, Times Magazine, Esquire, Harper's Bazaar and Entertainment Weekly, among others. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here with you both. Um, Laura, the election, the pandemic, we just, you know, start off light. Police violence and Ruth Bader, <laughs> Ruth Bader, Ginsburg de Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death, white militia violence, all things we've been chronicling here at the Fiction Nonfiction Podcast have made 2020 uh, really the most 20 terrifying year that I personally have lived through. And as a writer whose fiction is designed to make people at best uneasy and at worst terrified. What was the most perfectly crafted jump scare moment of the year for you so far? I guess yeah, oh my gosh, so many, <laughs> so many from which to choose. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it's been one of the most terrifying years that I've lived through also. And it's just, it has been so unrelenting to in so many different ways. Um, this maybe, uh, you know, isn't, I mean, I think when we think of a jump scare, we think of something that's really sudden um, or that it kind of comes out of the blue. And and this was maybe more of a, a creeping horror, but I do like really remember um, very vividly this sort of period of time, maybe like a handful of weeks, it's sort of in February when the pandemic went from, for us, you know, in the States went from being um, maybe, uh, an increasingly um, urgent, you know, um, buzz on the periphery of our lives to really being front and center. Here this year, my husband and I were living in Austin, Texas, and we were teaching there. And um, I drove uh, in the first week of March um, to Florida, where my family is, and we have remained there ever since. And I just remember being in the car. I think we were driving through um, Mississippi, and we were, it was late, late at night. We were just trying to keep going, keep going, um, and to stop as little as possible. And we were listening to which was not something we normally do in the car, but um, you know, we were just trying to keep abreast of the news as much as possible. And I just remember having this moment. I just felt like, yeah, we were in this kind of like the little like planet of our car um, on this on this quiet, um, you know, highway late late at night, driving through America. But just this moment where I, I thought like something fundamental has shifted in our world. Um, and I don't know that our lives will ever be the same again. Um, and it was this sort of like really sharp feeling of um, disaster and loss um, before, you know, we had all the context and the information that we have now. But when I think of, of yeah, of, of, of again, <laughs> we, the podcast were many, many hours, you know, I think I, there's certainly <laughs> others that, that come to mind, but, um, but that's a moment that was really distinct for me, just that feeling that, yeah, like some kind of um, sort of irrevocable turn has happened and the world as we once knew it is gone. Really gone. I, I feel like there's been a, f a series of steps like that, like, well, it, this will never happen, then that happens, then you're just like, okay, well, I can still do this, I can, I can get through, and like, you have a series of sort of acceptances that lead you to, it's like a little bit like the frog boiling, you know, metaphor, right? Like suddenly you're mm -hmm. living in a situation that's, it would have been unimaginable to you six months to one, six months earlier. I feel that way sometimes that's how your stories work. Like suddenly the characters ends up, ends up in places where they would not have imagined themselves to be. And yet the question is how they got there. Um, one of the things that made 2020 I mean, I'll, I'll, one of these things that we sort of slowly descended our way into in 2020 was this sort of what I feel like is a sort of undisguised death impulse among Trump's followers, yeah. you know, like we have a president who's really interested in death. And so are the people who are interested in him in a, in a bizarre way. 
Um, you know, you see that in the refusal of masks and these big rallies and the fact that the president himself probably nearly died in the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, you have militia groups wanting to kidnap governors of states, you know, so much of this uneasy confrontation with, for lack of a better term, the forces of death comes out and is echoed in your collection, I Hold a Wolf by the Ears, even the title, right, sounds a lot like 2020. Um, but you, you didn't write all these stories in 2020, or at least maybe none of them, you know, so when did you write them and how do they end up feeling so predictive of this time? Yeah, well, I didn't, I mean, I, of course I did not write them this year, but most were written um, uh, post 2016 election. So, I mean, I definitely was sort of aware of, of working So it's a Trump in, book. And it's, I mean, it's, um, it was yeah, written it, during it is, the Trump administration. It, it is in some ways. Um, Volcano House is the oldest story in the collection. And that story was written, I think, in um, 2011. Um, but um, I wrote, I think, four or five of the stories, so a little less than half the book at a, at a residency in 18. The um, majority of the stories were written, say, between 2016 and 2018. Volcano House is actually kind of an outlier um, in terms of its, its, its relative age um, compared to the others. So, uh, so they weren't written, you know, in our literal now, but, but they were written pretty close to our now. Um, and, and yeah, it was, you know, very alert to be sort of working in a, um, a post-Trump uh, world. So you mentioned Volcano House. Um, I'd love to talk specifically about that story, which is narrated by a woman whose sister is shot and sent into a coma by a mass shooter named John Evans. And the narrator says, um, and I'm quoting here, I, I just want John Evans and all his kind eradicated from this earth. And at the same time, I know it's not so easy that such an eradication would be meaningless if we can't cut out the roots. I mean, look, you know, I'm feeling in my like maybe not so secret heart this exact way about a lot of people <laughs> in America right now. Um, but if Biden wins this election, what are the roots that should be cut out? Well, one of my favorite stories in this collection is Lizards, um, which has a Kavanaugh reference in it. Uh, so mm -hmm. that fits with you having written it post 2016. I'm not gonna spoil the ending of the story, which is quite remarkable, but it has to do with a couple who both seem, who both seem to be like well-meaning people, general speaking, and yet, the Kavanaugh hearing set off this atavistic reaction sort of in their psyches, particularly the husband. I wonder if you could read us a section from that. Sure, I would be happy to. Um, so um, yes, this story takes place uh, in, in the midst of the Kavanaugh hearings um, and a husband, just to give a little context because I'm gonna start kind of closer. Um, around in the, maybe in the middle of the story and um, the husband, a husband and wife um, are in an apartment complex in Florida and they are doing the dishes and they start talking um, and then they start arguing. Uh, and the argument is sort of um, paused when the husband offers his wife um, like, a, like a LaCroix style seltzer. Um, but the, the sort of twist is, is that it's this like artisanal that he's getting from another husband um, in a um, in the apartment complex, and it's uh, laced with sedatives. So when his wife drinks it, she goes to she goes to sleep. Of course, she has noticed a correlation between drinking the sparkling water with a mysterious label she could never find anywhere else, and being seized by a narcoleptic longing for sleep. She believes the story about the family friend, even if making small batch artisanal water does seem like a curious way to spend one's time. But she likes the word artisanal, thinks it sounds aspirational, and also the water is just so refreshing. Late though, she started to get an icy feeling in her stomach whenever her husband hands her a and at the same time, for reasons she cannot articulate to herself, she feels compelled to accept his offering as though they have entered into an agreement she doesn't quite understand. Also, there is the problem of how her sleep has changed. After drinking the water, she used to wake feeling as though she had slept for a hundred years, like a character in a fairy tale. But recently, she has been coming to in the middle of upright in the shower or in the kitchen, her head stuck in the arctic glow of the freezer, even though she has no history of sleeping. Her husband 
always a sound sleeper has yet to notice. Still, she wants this life. She really does, even if she has to admit that ever since the judge entered into the news cycle, something inside her has been disturbed. The women who have come forward, they are so relatable. One of them looks like just like her Aunt Karen. So she wants to stand up. She wants to do something. If only she weren't so tired, she should go to a march. Instead, she has started shouting at those who cut her off in traffic and snapping at coworkers and picking fights with her poor husband who is trying his best, she supposes, to navigate these new currents. The truth is, is that she is angriest at her own anger. She suspects has arrived far too late to be of any real use. She has been kept too safe for too long. Besides, if she squints at the label, the can just looks like a LaCroix. This is what I need, she thinks as she sinks into bed. This is what the world needs. Sleep is holy. Maybe our problems would be solved if everyone just got more sleep. Isn't that what the woman from the Huffington Post has been trying to tell us? She drifts away listening to her husband bang around and his movements a dim echo through the wall. The last time he bought a flat of cans from his neighbor in a remote corner of one of the complex's many parking lots, the neighbor asked if he was taking full advantage of his new marital situation. He frowned and said he didn't know what that was supposed to mean. And then the neighbor told him that when his wife drinks a full can, you can't go out for the end of the world. Call me twisted, his neighbor said, it makes me feel ghost, like I'm walking through walls while everyone else is still using doors. The neighbor's confession was twisted. He assures him the kitchen, would anyone want to be a ghost? In the parking lot, he yanked the flat from his neighbor's arms and hurried away. But now that the notion is in his head, he can't scrub it out, especially when she kicks away the covers and he spots a smooth thigh all twisted up in the sheets. Sometimes he wonders what would happen if everyone were to one day stop pretending and he feels afraid. Thank you so much. Um, what I find so compelling and fascinating in that story is the way that the wife is aware of but chooses to ignore the way her husband is manipulating her. Now, all of us on the left believe that we virtuously resisted Trump and the forces of Trumpism long before Trump ever ran for office, but as you were saying before, like maybe we didn't. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one thing I was thinking about with a wife, like on the one hand, what her husband is doing to her is like monstrous, right? And unforgivable. So she is his victim unambiguously. Um, but I, I wanted to sort of complicate a simplistic one-to-one -one dynamic of she is, um, you know, like a, like a, yeah, a virtuous woman who's fallen into the clutches of this terrible man and to try and create, you know, a landscape of relationship that was a little bit more complex than that. And one thing that I was thinking a lot with the wife's character, I mean, I think both of these characters would identify as, um, as liberals or at least as Democrats. Um, they would likely be Biden voters, the husband remarks in, in a way to sort of like justify what he's doing, you know, recalls that he wore a deal me in shirt to the polls on election day. So we know he's not, you know, he's not a Trumper. Um, and yet he harbors this really like incredibly powerful misogyny that's been been leaking out um, over the course of the Kavanaugh trials. But I was thinking, you know, with the wife, I think what for me was was ultimately really interesting and compelling about her character is that it's aware that something is going on um, with, with this um, the water situation, but there's a part of her that really craves that obliteration, part of her that craves to look away and to turn away and to not engage. Yeah, when she um, says she wants this life, right? Uh, I thought that was important, you know, part of that story. Yeah, absolutely. And I think she's like reached, she's trying to, she's, she, he's trying to talk himself into the ways that he's like not a misogynist. Like I can't be, I voted for Hillary. Um, and she's trying to, I think, talk herself, you know, into, into still wanting a life with this particular person. Um, but when you think about, you know, with her character, like what would she be willing to give up in her own life to make um, a person like Kavanaugh uh, and his ascension to the Supreme Court less 
beautiful. And my sense of her in this moment of time is like not that much, you know? Yeah. Um, so she's sort of a flame with anger, but it's this sort of, it's this kind of useless churning anger. You know, it's not an anger that's necessarily compelling her to re-examine um, the, the world and her sort of position in it. So Kavanaugh and I have that. the same, sorry, I just, Kavanaugh and I have the same hometown. And as I listen to you talk, I'm like, yes, this is disgusting. <laughs> just taken back to that time so strongly. Yeah, sorry, I'm so God. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's fine. I mean, it's, it's, it, I mean, I think it's accurate about so many people. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a certain, right? There's something, there's a lot there about class as well, right? That the artifice and yeah, performance of class for sure. structures. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, and, and a certain kind of politics being part of that artifice but not really um, engaged or e examined. Well, I feel like I walked through it. We're, we're going to get to the husband in a minute, who's also who's the real bad guy here. So we're not all <laughs> taking this out on the wife in this story. But, you know, I walked through my like upper middle class urban suburb, right, that I live in and, and, and see women who have Biden signs in the front yard. But they also like have worked extremely hard at getting their hair dyed exactly a certain way. They've gone to a ton of weight classes they're wearing really expensive workout gear they're, they're they've like made themselves into a picture right mm -hmm. for a certain kind of structure of society that has to do with the male gaze right and i think like and they're at, when, when when that line is spoken in the story i think of i think of women that i see that i think imagine like well i want this life right but they're 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 doing something that is also harmful to them at the same time that they're mm -hmm. by wanting that life does that make sense yeah, yeah, it definitely does. I mean, I think that that's, yeah, I mean, there is some, there is that sense of like striving in the wife's character, you know, we, we feel as though we're kind of on our way somewhere, and we don't want to, you know, do anything to upset that, um, upset that trajectory. Um, I think that that's, yeah, definitely, definitely true for her. So I think in, in you know, this idea of being sort of asleep um, is manifesting in her life in, in several different ways. Like on the one hand, she's being literally drugged by her husband, um, but also there's this kind of like willful um, sleepfulness that she has entered into in terms of like not looking at anything in her life and her choices um, too, too carefully, lest they reveal uh, a reality that feels um, untenable. So can we go back to the last line of that reading? Sometimes he wonders what would happen if everyone were to one day stop pretending and he feels afraid. What do you think that <laughs> would mean for everyone to stop pretending? Yeah, well, um, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not sure what it would mean for, for yeah, for, for, for everyone. Um, but I think in this case, you know, there's this sort of like very thin veneer of civility um, that the husband is is sort of operating under, right? Like the husband who sells this lease, sells their water to other husbands in the apartment complex, like he's much more crass and more vulgar. Um, and we see that in other places in the story. And so it's sort of like, oh yeah, like I'm not that guy. I can't be that guy. And yet in his, and you know, this is the sort of beautiful and terrifying thing that give us access to is the innermost thoughts of, of characters, right? Like the things that they would never say aloud. And yet, I mean, what we think is a part of who we are um, and where we allow sort of the mind to go. So on the one hand, the husband is like, look, I wore a deal me in t-shirt to the polls and I'm not like cross like this has this other husband, like what more do you want from me? And on the other, you know, he is like, there is a part of him that is entertaining the idea of like drugging and raping his wife um, because it, it's, a, it's a possibility that is like available to him now in a way that it wasn't. And he's starting to feel this sort of like temptation. Um, so, you know, so that's a, that's, a, that's a pretty like, I think like deep well of horror, um, you know, underneath that, that air of civility um, for, for the husband. And I think, um, you know, I don't think of these stories as horror stories per se, but I am really interested in horror as a form. And these stories certainly occupy, um, you know, the landscape of like the uncanny and the haunted. Um, and I do, but I do think sort of horror is a form and the ghost story is a form. It really is so much about very oftentimes tearing away that superficial layer, tearing away the mask that a person sort of walks around with and really getting into the kind of like gnarly heart, um, often 
frightening heart um, that is sort of underneath all of that all of that. I mean, there's so many examples, um, both in like literature and film um, of, of horror narratives that 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 do that work so powerfully. So um, speaking of, you know, all of these examples last year around this time, we were talking for our Halloween episode with Victor Laval and, and Ben Percy about the rebirth of horror writing as a form of social critique. And you've just said you don't exactly think of these stories as horror stories. And yet I still think, um, right, your stories are advancing social critique. Um, in ways that remind me or call to mind certainly things like uh, like Jordan Peele's Get Out or Lovecraft Country or what Victor or Ben are doing. I'm curious about what some of your early influences in thinking about how to include social critique um, in those explorations of the uncanny or the kind of tearing off of the mask. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I think Get Out is like, that's an amazing example of that idea of like, you know, you think about that family, right? And it's like, you know, they're right. They look like they would have their Biden sign out in the yard and um, and probably, and, um, you know, maybe they'd even make a few phone calls, but like, yeah, you, you get, you get past that, that sort of performance of like, you know, liberal civility and, and it's a, it's a, it's a nightmare, um, <laughs> un underneath. Um, yeah, I, you know, a collection that was really important to me while working on this book was um, Mariana Enriquez's collection, Things We Lost in the Fire, which is such an amazing collection of short stories. Um, I do think of many of those stories as being ghost stories um, that work in and with um, hauntedness and they're all set in contemporary Buenos Aires. Um, and I think that they are particularly around landscape architecture. Um, I'm really interested in writing place and landscape is very important to me um, and and spaces that are spaces that are empty in a city and spaces that are occupied with people and the sort of like delineations between neighborhoods and that sort of like ever shifting you know landscape of, of a city and and the way that that landscape shifts throughout history um, and and I think her work does you know a beautiful um, frightening uh, job of exposing the sort of like unexamined um, dimensions of landscape and the unexamined um, questions and using this, this sort of the presence of the supernatural or possibly supernatural, um, the fantastic as a kind of instrument of pressure to like really crack that artifice open and see what is, um, yeah, lurking, lurking underneath. And I love, I mean, I, I love um, Victor too and Ben. Um, I'm big fans of both those, those writers. Thank you very much for joining us. We're going to encourage our listeners to pick up I Hold a Wolf by the Ears or any of Laura's books. And it was great to talk with you. Thank you both so much for having me. I felt like it was cathartic to get to talk about some of my election, <laughs> my election <laughs> anxieties. Um, so thank you both so much. Um, and thank you for your questions. Yeah, it's a real pleasure to have you with us.